No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligence greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creature that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infrared under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older world of space, a source of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It is curious to recall some of the mental habits of those departed days. At most, terrestrial men fancied there might be other men upon Mars, perhaps inferior to themselves and ready to welcome a missionary enterprise. Yet, across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds as ours to those of the beasts that perish, intellect vast and cool and unsympathetic, regard this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plan against us. And early in the 20th century came the great disillusionment. The planet Mars, I scarcely need remind the reader, revolves about the sun at a mean distance of 140 million miles. And the light and heat it receives from the sun is barely half of that received by the world. It must be, if the nuclear hypothesis has any truth, older than our world. And long before this earth ceased to be molten, life upon its surface must have begun its course. The fact that it is scarcely one-seventh of the volume of the earth must have accelerated its cooling to the temperature at which life could begin. It has air and water and all that is necessary for the support of animated existence. Yet, so then is man and so blind by his vanity that no writer up to the very end of the 19th century expressed any idea that intelligent life might have developed there, far or indeed at all beyond its earthly level. Nor was it generally understood that since Mars, Mars is older than our Earth, with scarcely a quarter of its superficial area and remoter from the Sun, it necessarily follows that it is not only more distant from time's beginning, but nearer its end. The secular cooling that must someday overtake our planet has already gone far indeed with our neighbor. Its physical condition is still largely a mystery. But we know now that even in its equatorial region, the midday temperature barely approaches that of our coldest winter. Its air is much more attenuated than ours. Its ocean have shrunk until they cover but a third of its surface. And as its slow seasons change, huge snowcaps gather and melt about either pole, and periodically inundate its temperate zone. The last stage of exhaustion, which to us is still incredibly remote, has become a present-day problem for the inhabitants of Mars. The immediate pressure of necessity has brightened their intellects, enlarged their power, and hardened their hearts. And looking across space with instruments, 
an intelligence such as we have scarcely dreamed of. They see, at its nearest distance, only thirty-five millions of miles sunward of them, a morning star of hope, our own warmer planet, green with vegetation and gray with water, with a cloudy atmosphere eloquent of fertility. With glimpses through its drifting clouds, with of broad stretches of populous country and narrow navy clad seas, and we men, the creature who inhabit this earth, must be to them at this as alien and lowly as are the monkeys and the lemurs to us. The intellectual side of man already admits that life is an essential struggle for existence, and it will seem that this too. Is the belief of the minds upon Mars? Their world is far gone in its cooling, and this world is still crowded with life, but crowded only with what they regard as inferior animals. To carry warfare sunward is, indeed, the only escape from the destruction that generation after generation creeps upon them. Judge of them too harshly. We must remember what Luther's and utter destruction our own species have wrought, not only upon animals such as the vanished bison, but upon its inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a world of extermination waged by European immigrants. In the space of fifty years, are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? The Martians seem to have calculated their descent with amazing subtlety. Their mathematical learning is evidently far in excess of ours, and to have carried out their preparation with a well-knit perfect unanimity. Had our instrument permitted, we might have seen the gathering trouble far back in the 19th century. Men like Schiaparelli watched the red planet. It is out by the by that for countless centuries Mars had been the star of war, but failed to interpret the fluctuating appearance of the markings they map so well. All that time, the Martians must have been getting ready. Thank、you